Aspects of Occultism by Dion Fortune, 1996 book review. Quote, we are accustomed to think of Christianity, Judaism, and Mohammedanism as three monastic faiths, and all the rest as polytheistic and pagan. But if we look more closely into all things, we shall find that the most polytheistic religions are at heart monotheistic, and that even the avowedly monotheistic have a kinship with polytheism in certain of their aspects. End quote. The book opens with an intensely intricate and condensed chapter entitled God and Gods, wherein Fortune starts by breaking down the monotheistic belief and delves into the innermost core, whereat is found that religion's, that religion's predecessor. The prime example that she uses is Christianity, which has its roots in Kabbalistic Judaism. The various angels of the monotheistic faith are the gods and goddesses of a polytheistic faith, only expressed in different forms. She be explains the creation of angels and the gods and what part they play in the religion, culture, and macrocosm. None of these things were new to me, for they are easily come upon by careful thinking. The chapter then moves in a very different direction into the magical art of evocation. The prime aspect of this then discussed is the nature of the being summoned and the processes of manifestation. This is done clearly and concisely. However, she states that spirits cannot be brought into physical manifestation without a, quote, materializing medium as a member of that circle, end quote. I do not know what she means by a materializing medium as a person or as anything else. The statement that you need such a person is contrary to what I believe and have read in other books. Since I have no experience with summoning spirits through the Kabbalistic method of evocation, which as she is a Kabbalist, I assume is what she is speaking of, I, not, I cannot confirm nor deny this. The two distinct parts of the chapter then merge in the last two pages. The discussion of evocation, Kabbalism, and polytheism becomes one, along with the new topic of drug use, demonic evocation, and idolatry. This is a wonderful chapter filled with diamonds of knowledge which would take a long time for me to truly evaluate. In the chapter, Sacred Centers, Fortune discusses the various theories of these places of power. The Sacred Centers are places where now there exist Christian churches erected over the ancient pagan centers to aid the church in influencing the mind of the people. These places contain an often inherent power stronger than that of most other places on the planet. This power, Fortune theorizes, comes from the world of minerals far beneath the planet's surface. This power is sometimes due to numerous magical operations performed on the site, for such things raise the vibrations of everything in and around the area. It also makes a stronger connection to the corresponding astral space. Fortune gives also examples of such places. Quote, the great cathedrals of England, Durham, Chester, Lincoln, Wells, Winchester, and Canterbury form the double triangle or hexagram, but these centers are very old and were, were sites of pagan temples in pre-Christian times. And to recover the type of influence one would have to seek their old names and meanings of their names. End quote. The second part of this chapter is dedicated to the subject of metaphysics, and more specifically the higher planes, and how they relate to the physical. She discusses the various beings of each plane, and that because they vibrate at different rates, they are unknown to each other and to common man. The metaphysical subject of vibrations has always been my favorite. I was excited by reading this, and could feel a super sensible reaction in my higher self, which always occurs when the pathway is clear. This is an excellent chapter, and one of the better ones dealing with the subject. The astral plane, quote, has very rightly been called the plane of illusion, for people have such varied ideas concerning it. In studying the technique of the planes, one may fall into error as regarding them as only separate and distinct modes of consciousness, whereas on closer consideration we still see that they are interrelated and actually function in pairs, end quote. The fourth chapter of this book is entitled The Astral Plane, wherein is discussed the strongly supported occult theories of a higher existence. Much of the chapter is, according to Fortune, the teachings of a master, brackets, a perfected human being who has finished their evolutionary period on the earthly plane, and brackets, of the inner planes, a master of the inner planes. In support of this very realistic claim, I noticed a distinct difference in the form of speech from Fortune's own writing. The style of speech is similar to that of other contacted beings of whom I read many supposed works thereof. Whether the contents of this chapter are the teachings of a contacted master or is merely an excellent forgery, the validity of the contents is nevertheless not to be disputed. Fortune says that there are four planes of existence and that two are planes of form and two planes of force. The following format of the planes is from Fortune's book. Spiritual plane force. It is through the higher planes that the lower planes 
are brought into existence. Mental plane form, astral plane force, physical plane form. The students of the tree of life will recognize this as it is well symbolized on the tree. Imagine a chalice being filled by a bottle of infinite wine. The chalice will eventually be filled to its brim, but because the flow of the infinite wine never ceases, it must eventually overflow. If one is smart, he will catch the falling wine in another container, possibly one of a different nature than the chalice. The infinite wine flow shows the infinite energy of what Kabbalists call the Sof Or, meaning limitless light. The wine cup symbolizes the highest level of the spiritual plane known to some as Kether. The overflowing wine is the emanations of the spiritual plane that form the mental plane. This process repeats itself until it reaches the physical plane, at which point, to my knowledge, it goes no further. This concludes a part of the process through which the infinite planes draw their energy and hence exist. <clears throat> Emanationism. What Fortune primarily bases this chapter on is not the genesis of the infinite planes as explained above in the wine chalice metaphor, but the way in which manifestation occurs in the various planes and concludes by physical manifestation. Quote, if you want to understand the astral plane, think of the true astral plane as consisting of streaming rays of light without form at all, and the forms of the astral, whether derived from mind or matter, as distinct from the pure emotional forces as are the human beings from the land they walk about on. You have, therefore, the plane and its inhabitants. It amazes me, given the extensive higher planes, how many, much of their metaphysics, fortune crammed into this small five-page chapter. There are literally hundreds of books written on the astral plane, which is often used generically to refer to all higher planes. Many of them do not contain half the information which Fortune's small chapter does. However, because of this, it is off, often a mid-strain, mind-strain to sift through Fortune's extensive amount of information. Fortune states that everything starts with thought, and then later it becomes manifest. Thus it is that in magic, the magician focuses his true will, brackets a term originating in the golden dawn to describe the will of the higher self and by it affects the astral plane by the way of the mental plane creating a thought form this exists as a thought form on the astral plane force the occultist lives by the old hermetic axiom as above so below and therefore the thought form also manifests on the physical plane form Though ceremonial magic is not the only act which creates this result, it, along with alchemy, including prayer, are the only practices in which the operator is consciously aware of his actions. I will stop explaining the theory of metaphysics here before it gets too convoluted. If one is, however, interested in metaphysics, he will no doubt have enough information at his or her hands for at least 20 years of study. The information I gained from this chapter is some of the most fulfilling I have ever learned from any other book on the subject. I would henceforth recommend this book to anyone looking for some detailed and intellectual facts and theories about any aspect of occultism. Peace out, homies. Aspects of Occultism by Dion Fortune, 1996.